afternoon. I call this meeting of the Human Services Policy Committee to order. Members, please take your seats. The first item of business is the approval of minutes from February 15, 2023. Um, Representative Coran, would you like to move the minutes? So moved, Chair. Representative Coran moves uh, the approval of the minutes from February 15, 2023. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. The uh, minutes from February 13, 2023 are approved. We've got a full agenda with four bills today, so we're going to be moving right along. The first bill we will be hearing, oh, we are missing our first, uh, we'll go on to our second bill then. So the uh, second bill that we will be, so the first bill we're going to go to is, uh, is House File 1198, Representative Hansen. If you'd like to come down to the testifier, please, and move your bill. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. And I do have an amendment for this bill, the A1 amendment as okay. well. Yeah, first we'll need you to move your file, uh, your, your bill to be referred and placed on. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So I'll Children move. Children and families. I'll move that House File 1198 be referred to the um, Children and Families Finance and Policy Committee. Very good. And you have an A1 amendment. If you'd like to move your A1 amendment and explain it. Yes, please, Chair. I'd like to move the A1 amendment. This gets the bill into the shape I would like and incorporates feedback we received from DHS. Very good. Any questions for the author? This is to get it in the, bill, the bill in the shape she would prefer. Hearing none, all in favor of the A1 amendment to House File 1198 signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Amendment, uh, uh, the motion is approved. We have before us House File 1198 as amended. Representative Hansen, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce your bill, and then we'll go to your testifiers. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, committee members. For many years, we've been talking about the mental health crisis that our state is in. We've talked about solutions to the workforce shortages and bed shortages. We've talked about inadequate access to care and the complicated systems and waiver services that exist. This all takes us time to address, and we need to be sure that we are equally investing in solutions that provide care directly to the people who need it most, in this case, the kids. Our current system of children's mental health care is really complicated. The best way I've described it to people who haven't navigated it before is that it's like traveling to a bunch of individual islands to get your services for your child or your client. And the communication between those islands can be tricky for a whole host of reasons. The specific services needed, needed by these kids, they most certainly exist, but they're often far apart and can only be accessed by venturing across choppy waters to get there. There are many risks along the way of losing someone, and the people seeking this care from island to island do so because they care deeply for the child who needs help. Whether it be a parent, a school social worker, school psychologist, or any number of important grown-ups in a kid's life, navigating the territory of children's mental health takes teamwork, grit, and dedication. And today we have an opportunity to simplify, streamline, and make things easier by building bridges between these islands and between the services so that people can more easily access our existing system that's out there for help. House File 1198 intends to grow a family-centered mental health continuum, and it builds adequate access to care. We know that too many children and families in Minnesota are waiting months for needed mental health care or not getting access at all. And without support, too many children have their first experience with mental health during a crisis. And they may end up needing the highest level of care, hospitalization. We've all heard stories about family, families and kids languishing in emergency rooms and medical professionals asking us to do more to support these families before they land in the ER. Early intervention matters, and providing access to care earlier is far more effective for our littlest Minnesotans when they need it. 
This propo proposal is from the Mental Health Legislative Network, and it reflects priorities for children's mental health care with goals to break down barriers and urgently build better access to the mental health services. The key points of this legislation include maximizing existing Medicaid benefits to support children and families with services and supports that we have today, which are of critical importance as we design immediate responses within a landscape that is limited by staff and financial resources. It includes priorities to support early intervention, like timely responses for kids so that they can do better and prevent the need for additional intervention. It builds on what's been proven to work for children and families. It focuses on family supports to honor family voices and the needs that they have to support the child and enhance the skills and abilities of the family to help the child through treatment and to achieve well-being in their community. And it sustains and builds a family-centered continuum by building these services that must center on the greater needs of children and families. It exemplifies our opportunity to develop the service designs that are what families want and need to effectively help our kids. I'm really grateful for the work of the Mental Health Legislative Network. This is the kind of work that makes Minnesota a better place to live, work, and raise a family. This is the kind of policy that has the power to revolutionize the way that we provide critical care to our littlest Minnesotans. And as a mom, there's no higher priority than ensuring our little ones are cared for just like they were my own. It's always the right time to do what's right by our kids. So I thank you for taking the time to hear this bill today. And with that, I'll turn it over to testifiers who will go over an overview of the bill and also provide stories from their lines of work. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Hansen. The first person we have is uh, uh, Sue Abderholden, if you'd like to take a seat, introduce yourself. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, my legs I need to have my feet on the ground. Um, I'm Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I'm Kirsten Anderson, uh, Executive Director of Respire Minnesota. Welcome to both of you. If you'd like to go ahead and start, if we're gonna be rotating back and forth, I wanna make sure that we're identifying as we rotate so if somebody's listening to the tape, they know who's talking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Sue Abderholden. The Mental Health Legislative Network, which is a coalition of over 40 organizations working to improve the mental health system in Minnesota, is bringing forward this bill to address the real crisis facing our children and youth. Prior to the pandemic, only 20% of children received the mental health care they needed, and then the pandemic hit. Every report, whether it's the CDC or our own student survey, finds that our children and youth have increased mental health needs. In 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association declared a national emergency. Unfortunately, our fragile system is not able to meet those needs, especially for children and youth who have complex needs. This bill re represents a comprehensive approach to responding to these needs. I'll start with section one. This ensures that parents who are an infant child only, meaning they are on social security due to their disability, are able to access childcare when they need more intensive treatment or when they are simply struggling with their mental health. We wanna make sure that no parent forgoes treatment when they don't have someone to care for their child. And we wanna make sure that a child is with a responsive adult. When you're on infant child only, you do not qualify for childcare. Section two, um, you've heard before, we simply want to make sure that youth can access outpatient treatment without parental consent. As a reminder, they can already access inpatient treatment without parental consent. Section three expands the innovative um, innovation grant program to address the needs of children, especially with children with complex needs, such as having autism and aggressive behaviors, reactive attachment disorder, PTSD with aggression, a co-occurring developmental or intellectual disability, a TBI, a co-occurring complex medical issue, or severe emotional dysregulation and schizophrenia. These are the children we truly are not serving. Section four expands respite care to those families whose children have been hospitalized or been in residential treatment, mm -hmm. and also children who have utilized crisis services, been in the ER, or lost their in-home supports. I wanna remind people that respite care is a, is, a, is a program where parents basically get to recharge their batteries. Um, I was a respite care provider and you could see families coming on Friday to drop their children off. They looked horrible and exhausted. 
They come back on Sunday night. They got to rest. They got to maybe have dinner with their spouse, do their laundry, whatever they needed to do. And there's plenty of research that shows that that actually prevents hospitalizations. We also want to make sure that families have regularly scheduled respite care, not just once a year during the summer, but once a month when you have a child with high needs. Um, sections 5 and 27 are the third path. You might remember this from several years ago. We created a third path to residential uh, treatment um, for children whose families um, have not been charged with abuse or neglect. So we didn't want them to have to go through the child protection system where relative searches are conducted. This language fixes a glitch in the law that left counties not fully implementing it. Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Kirsten Anderson, go ahead, please. Thank you. So uh, Sue and I are, are just walking through the bill section by section. So uh, section six is child and adult transition to the community. This is also in the governor's budget and takes in, in includes expansion to in include children in this grant, also called whatever it takes. This grant helps children and youth transition from institutional care to community support. Section seven, eight, and nine family and youth reflected in the amendment, peer specialists, you'll hear from later on this morning as well. Uh, family and youth peers are incredibly valuable in connecting, responding, and effectively meeting child and family needs, oftentimes called the secret sauce to delivering care to kids and families. Uh, peers allow for expanded, this language allows for expanded training opportunities and includes youth peers, young people with lived experiences, so older adults, younger adults, um, as eligible peer specialists. Sue Abner Holden again. Go ahead, Ms. Abner Holden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Section 10 and 23 seek to fix the problem with Youth Assertive Community Treatment or Youth Act. The legislature did expand Youth Act from 16 to 21 to 8 to 26, but CMS would not allow the expansion higher than 21. Mm. I have to say that 21 is a horrible age to lose your intensive services in terms of transitioning to adulthood, and many will not qualify for the Adult Act team, so we're trying to address this need. Section 11 and 12, many of our crisis teams across the state, and as a reminder, all 87 counties are covered by mobile mental health crisis teams. Uh, frankly, I have, are much more focused on adults with mental illnesses than children and largely have training on adults. So we wanna add training requirements of the team so that they are better able to serve children and teens and their families. Kirsten Anderson again. Kirsten Anderson, go ahead, please. Uh, Section 13 focuses on non-emergency medical transportation and aligning existing mechanisms within that current statute to focus on children. Uh, this is a reflection of diverse stakeholders who came together to, again, use those tools that currently exist to accelerate getting to a solution that's really child-focused so that kids can access regular treatment and other medical needs through non-emergency medical transportation. Director Abdul Holden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, section 14, when we first passed legislation for psychiatric residential treatment facilities or PRTFs, we had actually envisioned that they would specialize. Um, but DHS decided that they should just take any child um, that needed care. But we believe that the needs of our children who have more complex mental illnesses are better served by allowing PRTFs to specialize. You know, if you um, are trained to work with children with high aggression, that's very different than maybe working with a child who's experienced trauma. So we want to let them to, we really want them to be able to um, specialize so that they can better meet the needs of children. Section 15 and 16, we try to address the fact that if your child has high aggression, you are not going to find a PCA to work for you for $17 an hour. It's just not going to happen. You can make more at a fast food restaurant. And so we need to pay more in order to provide that help and support to families. Dr. Anderson. Section 17 through 19 is a reflection in the amendment of uh, amendment to ch children's clinical care coordination. So the new language in the amendment seeks to clarify that this existing benefit can be used by members of a child's team to do the critical work of coordinating between school, home, and community. This recommendation was initially from the Children's Cabinet convened working group on children's therapeutic services and supports, uh, also co-convened by the Department of Human Services and the Department of Education with a number of experts. So um, a top priority from that group and continues to be reflected in some of the other recommendations we hear from um, young people who are transitioning from residential treatment back to community that being able to really coordinate with the team is a high priority. 
section 20 to 22 is an at-home service rate enhancement. So this reflects that we see that some of the most effective care is provided to children in the home with their families. And this is an incredibly meaningful and effective approach. It requires highly complex and, and skilled staff, and it is incredibly taxing. So we have a great need to staff these models with skilled, agile team members, and it's very challenging to recruit and retain staff who are doing this highly sophisticated work. So you'll see reflected in this proposal an enhanced compensation for staff who are doing that in-home work. Director Abderholden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Section 24 actually addresses a huge area of concern for us. Families who cannot take their child home from the ER or hospital or perhaps even residential treatment because they cannot meet their needs nor keep them or their other family members safe are being charged with neglect and abandonment. But it is not the parent who is neglecting their child, it's our system. These DHS has issued a new bulletin on this topic, but we do not feel it is strong enough. But we absolutely believe that these parents should not be ending up in the child protection system because our system cannot meet their child's needs. Uh, Director Anderson. Mr. Chair, Section 25 is looking at the Qualified Residential Treatment Program aftercare definition. So Qualified Residential Treatment Programs are defined by a federal standard and newly require six months of aftercare following transition from a QRTP back home. And this, thus far we've defined aftercare as one phone call per month to the family. We're seeking to include definition of aftercare allowing for service providers to deliver peer support specialist supports and care coordination just referenced in one of the past sections to really deliver care and support to the family that's meaningful and connecting the child and the family to community life. Director Abner Holden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Section 26, Hennepin County actually created a family response and stabilization service and we believe it would be helpful to try that in rural Minnesota. Family response provides an immediate response to a parent or care caregiver and their child to de-escalate the current stressor, do a crisis assessment to determine immediate needs, and to develop an immediate safety plan. Family response staff respond within one hour of a phone call and remain involved for up to 72 hours following the call. If a family needs additional support past the initial 72 hours, family stabilization services are available to work with the family for up to eight weeks. Family stabilization services work to build the parent caregivers of capacity to respond to the mental health and behavioral needs of their child using formal and informal supports and services. Director Anderson. Mr. Chair, thank you. Section 28 is deleted in the amendment. Section 29 reflects collaborative intensive bridging services. So this is a Dakota County and uh, local Minnesota provider design service. It's been a highly effective focusing on families who otherwise might be needing residential treatment for their child and can either shorten the length of stay for a child in residential treatment or even avoid length of stay, avoid the stay at all um, by delivering that intensive care to the child and the family in the community. Uh, this is one that we've wanted to have included in the state plan amendment and, and the counties have been very supportive of, of taking that direction, so reflected here. The next sections are speak to the appropriations areas. Some of that is amended um, in your A1. We're seeking to match up with what the governor has proposed on a number of areas, um, and I don't know that we want to go through all of that. Okay, any other comments, uh, uh, Director Abderholden? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to end by saying that, you know, often we try to see is there just one simple <clears throat> thing that we can do, right, to build our mental health system, and there isn't. It can't just be one thing mm -hmm. um, because children have different needs, complex needs. Um, we want to build on what does work. We want to fill in the gaps. Um, but there just isn't one thing that we can do. But these are the things that the Mental Health Legislative Network, which includes you know, providers, uh, parents, people with lived experience, came together to say, here's what we really think we should do to really address the crisis that we're facing. Very good. Uh, Director Anderson, any further comments? Mr. Chair, that was very well said. Okay, very good. Thank you both. Uh, you'll be available in case, in case we have questions. Uh, we'll go to the rest of the test fires and I'll open up to questions and comments after they are finished. So for the first test fire, I have uh, Joanna Dye. If you'd like to come down, please. And then after Joanna will be uh, Laura LaCroix uh, Doolin.
Hi, welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here today. Please introduce yourself and start your testimony. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Joanna Dye, and I am a parent partner at Nexus Girard in Austin, Minnesota. In my role, I frequently hear from parents how difficult it has been to get mental health care for their child. Long waiting lists, inadequate services, not feeling heard or seen by their counties or health care providers when they're begging for help. And it's a word I hear often, begging. I think society tends to dismiss youth with emotional and behavioral difficulties as being the products of bad parenting. And there's an assumption that parents aren't trying to help their kids. I can tell you personally as a parent with a child that has mental illness and as a professional whose job it is to work with families that parents do want to help their kids. Children's mental health treatment services like Nexus Gerard offer trauma-informed treatment to youth and their families. We provide safety for youth who are experiencing mental illness and need help regulating emotions and behaviors. Youth who are suicidal, who self-harm, who react violently in their homes and communities, youth who are especially vulnerable to drug use, running away, and sexual exploitation, along with other high-risk behaviors. With intensive therapy and highly trained, knowledgeable, and experienced direct care staff, teams of professional, professionals help youth with individualized treatment and teaching healthy coping skills. And we can, with knowledge, dedication, and time, help these youth heal and grow and become productive members of society. We help families recognize that dysfunctional or dysregulated behaviors are a symptom of mental illness and find solutions to help keep families together. We help youth overcome hurdles and become healthy, productive people. To be honest, that's why I'm in this work. Seeing kids get better feels so rewarding. I often hear from parents how alone they feel in the struggle with their child's mental health. Family, friends, and coworkers don't always understand how difficult it is. This lack of understanding leads to parents socially isolating and feeling hopeless and helpless, defeated. Dealing with mental health issues can often unnecessarily feel shameful. As a parent partner, I offer judgment-free, empathetic support and advocacy. I come to the table with the perspective of a mom who also has a child with mental illness. I tell families, I haven't just been in your shoes, I am in your shoes. <laughs> parent partners build on strengths in the family. We help parents feel seen, heard, and empowered. Parents who feel supported have a higher capacity to support and advocate for their children. My relationship with families doesn't end when their children transition home. We connect monthly and talk through difficulties, and I help them connect with needed resources. I recently met a mother and her young son on the day he was admitted to Nexus Gerard. Despite being a small grade school age boy, he is already, um, her son has already had years of violent outbursts and uncontrollable behaviors. He has been unable to remain safe at home or in school. Mom was in tears explaining to me how she's been doing everything she could to help him, but she could not keep him safe, and she was afraid of, for her own safety and the safety of the other children in the home. They were fully engaged with all the services offered over time, while she asked repeatedly for, higher level, for a higher level of care she knew her child needed. She asked me, how do you explain to people that you both love your child and are afraid of your child? They look at me and they see a little, or they look at him and they see a little boy and they don't understand. The mom sitting in front of me had a black eye that she had gotten from the same little boy. He is a child who likes Legos and cartoons and has a security blanket and likes being cuddled by his mom. But the same little boy has a history of holding lives to his sibling, physically assaulting his mom, chronic self-harming, making threats to kill his family and destroying property at school. His mom is a good mom. She loves her child. She thanked me over and over for simply listening to her and understanding her. Throughout her son's stay, we have maintained close connection and her son is improving. He's successfully attending school now and learning how to deal with his anger and emotions. His time at home has been going well and his mom is feeling more confident, empowered, and hopeful. 
I'm also working with a father who is a farmer and is raising two kids alone. His ex-wife had custody until her drug use spiraled, spiraled out of control, and it was determined that her boyfriend had been physically and sexually abusing the kids. This father feels incredibly guilty for not being able to protect his children. His 15-year-old daughter has engaged in self-harm by cutting herself and was hospitalized after attempting to take her own life by swallowing an entire bottle of Tylenol. The first time I met him, he told me that he is afraid to sleep and is up at a doll now night checking on her to make sure she is still alive. He has to work and worries about times when he can't be at home with his kids while farming. He has used all his PTO while she was in the hospital and can't afford to lose his job. He also has a 13-year-old who needs his loving attention. He is exhausted and terrified of not being able to keep his child from taking her own life. He feels like he, he, feels like he is failing as a parent and he explained that he felt judged and condescended to by the professionals he dealt with while his child was hospitalized. As a parent partner, I've worked to help this parent to release the shame and guilt and recognize that he's a good man and a good dad. And his kids not only need him as, or see him as, his kids not only see him as their rock, they need him to show them how to be strong, resilient, and hopeful for their future. I am just a mom who has experienced the anxiety and fear of waiting for help while my child struggled with mental illness. I am fortunate to have this role of parent partner with, Nex with Nexus Gerard, where I get to help other parents navigate a system that can be so difficult and frustrating. Parenting is really hard. It's nearly impossible when families feel helpless and hopeless. We have the ability to change that and strengthen families and communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for the work that you've done as a parent partner. Thank you. You're welcome. Next I have Laura LaCroix Dullum and then after that is Shannon Brown. Uh, we do have three other bills and I know right now we've got at least four representatives that are going to have questions. So I just want people to be cognizant of the time as they're making the presentations. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Laura LaCroix DeLune, and I am here on behalf of the Minnesota Prenatal to Three Coalition and the Family Home Visiting Coalition. Knowing that you have three more bills to go, I will trim this down and let you know um, we are supportive of the, of the entire bill, but really want to speak today about what you find on page 35 of the bill and in the amendment uh, lines 3.23, 3.29. Uh, I would really like to say that um, focus this conversation on the early childhood brain development. Um, I'm hoping that many of you know by now, 80% of the brain is developed by the age of three. And one's future health, mental health, and cognitive ability is really built on how our brains, um, and, and our brains are built in those first three years, and how a child is responded to uh, by their parent <coughs> or their caregiver. And so having access to infant and early childhood mental health services when families are experiencing trauma or the parent has experienced trauma can really provide some critical stabilizing supports to families early on in life. So what we're recommending in the amendment is to increase resources for infant and early childhood mental health as well as providing a brief assessment that would allow families to access services sooner than a, a longer uh, assessment process. Why this is important is because currently families are waiting anywhere from three to nine months to get services. When we look at the three year period, if you're waiting three quarters of a year to get services, we're really not taking advantage of, of getting these services to families soon enough. And let me just say, I, just to give you an example of what infant and early childhood mental health, like why would somebody need to go into that? Um, I think it's important to know that families will um, seek services because they've experienced trauma themselves. So a parent or a caregiver may be in a domestic abusive relationship and having the ability to respond to their child's needs, it's that call and response that parent and caregiver give to a child when they're young, is in, it's, um, it's impeded by that abuse in, the, in that relationship. Another example might be um, an infant who might be sexually abused by an extended family member, you still have that primary caregiver who's caring for that child and you have to rebuild the trust and the relationships of the, the, 
the primary caregiver with the infant and child. So delaying services doesn't serve anybody, and we want to see increased resources there. I also want to highlight, before I jump off, is um, the important provisions of uh, providing some MFIP child care to families who are seeking um, mental health services. It's critically important that families are able to get their mental health services so that they can be their best selves as they raise their young children. And we hope that you'll support this as amended. Thank you. Uh, next I have uh, um, Shannon Brown, and then after that will be Brooke Kulzer. Hi, my name is Shannon Brown, and I'm the CEO at Fernbrook Family Center. I thank you for the opportunity for, to speak to House File 1198, and specifically in-home services. Fernbrook provides in-home services across southeast Minnesota in nine counties. In my 12 years doing this work, I've seen in-home services be both effective and transformative. Being able to sit with a parent while a child is having a tantrum and tearing apart their bedroom and coach the parent on how to respond. Being able to sit with a child and practice coping skills while they struggle with anxiety so debilitating they can't leave their room. Supporting a caregiver and implementing a morning or evening routine to help get kids to school to successfully avoid truancy court. All of these things have a positive impact on kids and families in Minnesota. One parent recently shared that prior to receiving in-home mental health services for their daughter, the police have been called to their house weekly, often multiple times per week. The nine-year-old girl had, was adopted and had experienced being held at gunpoint, sexual abuse, and neglect for the first three years of her life. They had tried several outpatient therapists, and the child would refuse to get out of the car, would destroy the therapist's office, and would not participate. The adoptive parents could not manage the child's behaviors and could not keep others in the home safe and were often scared and had to call law enforcement to assist. The child would hit, kick, throw things, and try to run away. Police would transport to the emergency department where they would attempt to stabilize her and send her back home. The caregivers were fearful of this child hurting them, herself, or the younger children in the home. Through in-home services, we were able to identify triggers, create safety plans, coach caregivers on how to respond to safety concerns, and build relationships between the family members so healing from the trauma could happen. This caregiver shared that police have not been called in several months, and the family was able to go on a small family vacation recently without fear of what might happen. Due to the nature of the intensive in-home services we provide, which are seen in a variety of the models listed in this bill, we were very challenged to recruit and retain the talented staff we desperately need to help all of the families who can benefit. The hours are long, the travel time is exhausting, and the work is especially difficult. These are complex families with many barriers. Many of the families we serve in their homes do not have stable housing, transportation, or access to very basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, and safety on a daily basis. If we didn't go to them to provide these essential mental health services, they simply would not receive them, especially in the areas we serve. It might be 70 to 80 miles round trip to see a mental health provider. That's at least $15 in gas these families simply do not have. That's three hours they can't take off work. That is time they don't have to load up their car with their three younger siblings so one child can receive one hour of therapy. Doing in-home work requires additional skills and training due to the complex nature of the family systems the staff are encountering in this work. This proposal to increase staff compensation by 30% for in-home services will be incredibly helpful in our efforts to staff this work with the sophisticated and seasoned staff who can make the greatest difference for families. Working in the complex systems we encounter, doing the in-home work requires additional training and experience. Supporting our teams with training opportunities and evidence-based practices, trauma-informed responses, de-escalation techniques, and crisis management will certainly increase our capacity to continue to serve kids like the nine-year-old girl I previously mentioned. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, I have Brooke Kulzer, and then after that will be Brianna Bushman. Welcome Good to the table. Introduce you. yourself and please start your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Fisher and committee members. My name is Brooke Kulzer. I am a emergency department nurse at a rural outlying hospital and I'm a member of the Minnesota Nurses Association. Imagine coming to work at a busy emergency department. You leave your family, you drive past beautiful countryside and Minnesota lakes to arrive at your rural hospital. 
You walk in only to find more patients than staff and more patients waiting for your care in the department than your department can house. You find an adolescent patient simply wandering a back hall. He's just looking for an iPad charger. That depicts a typical start of a shift for me. The problem is in rural medicine, we have few psychiatric resources available, let alone pediatric services. When I receive my patient assignment, they are officially mine to provide the care and to give them the vital care they need that we don't have the resources to provide. What do you need? How can I help? I ask every patient that. Do you need food? The answer for this kid is going to be yes. Because of the trauma they have endured, they're food motivated. Let me get you a Sudoku puzzle, the food, a TV remote. That's all I have to offer now. Except my time and my attention, and even that can be stretched thin. Now they're back in their room, waiting 50 plus hours in my busy ER for placement in the cities or out outlying in the state. Oftentimes they're alone. Their parents are either exhausted or the foster family has decided they can no longer care for this child. This child occupies a bed in our state at which other people need, that elderly patient that had a fall or the child with a broken bone. Now they're escalating. They're tired, they're bored, and their behavior ramps up. I have to redirect my staff away from other critical patients to restrain this child because they're destroying the room. They're putting themselves and other patients at risk. They're simply asking for help and putting my staff in harm's way. Code 21, security is there. Police are on standby. They now require a one-to-one -one nurse. And now triage calls. They have a suicidal adolescent that has walked in through the door. We do not have the resources to help care for these patients. Except in my ER, I have an assessor on an iPad that I can offer once a day. During a typical 24 hours in the life of a psych patient in my ER, they're going to see four to eight nurses and four to six amazing ER providers, day after day, until they demand our undivided attention once again. And I'm reminded the reality that we're simply occupying their time until they get down to the mental health facility that they so need and that stays in the forefront of my mind, the misalignment of our healthcare resources. All because there's not enough in the metro or in the rural communities to support these kids. Our system is broken. I will know this child by name. I will see them again shortly or their siblings in another day that I come to work in our emergency room in rural medicine. Our rural communities desperately need more support because their families and the patients and the communities deserve better. Please pass HF 1198 to help fill the gaps in services and ensure that emergency departments are not the main source of crisis intervention services in these communities. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your testimony. And then finally, I have Brianna Bushman. If you'd like to come down, please. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. My name is Brianna Bushman and I work at Children's Hospital here in St. Paul. I'm here to provide you with the face of a bedside nurse who has seen firsthand the effects from lack of mental health services these children have. The need for better mental health services has taken such a toll on the services Children's Hospital has to offer to the community. We are seeing more and more children in the emergency department waiting room, um, waiting for rooms because of the lack of bed space in the ER due to the number of kids with mental health diagnoses waiting for placement in those beds. For example, just last week, our 30-bed ER had 13 kids with mental health diagnoses in those beds waiting for placement. That's almost half of our ER stripped of the ability to provide care for children that come to us with emergent needs. That's 13 nursing assistants we have to pull from other parts of our hospital to sit with these mental health diagnoses children. Um, we are at the point now where we can either treat kids that come to the ER in our resuscitation rooms utilized for CPR or traumas or have them wait in our waiting room for on average four hours because they don't have rooms. Um, this means these children are not receiving the full scope of services that they need as urgently as they could if they were receiving care in the correct care setting. The lack of appropriate services along with mental health system that is equipped to support children leads to children experiencing much more complex and challenging mental health needs than if they were able to receive intervention services sooner. We have medically complex children waiting in our waiting room who need access to intensive care and treatment. With our extremely limited bed space in the ER and Children's St. Paul's plan to consolidate the PICU, these children are receiving inadequate care that could easily be remedied. With hospitals making decisions to remove vital services, we need to ensure appropriate options are available. 
This mental health bill will not only provide services to mental health patients, but will open up the ER to care for the medically complex kids appropriately and free up nursing assistants who can now help throughout the hospital instead of just the emergency department. I urge you to support House File 1198 to ensure children can receive vital mental health support that will allow them to be healthy and successful in their lives and will help reduce the burden on our already short-staffed hospitals to care for these children who should be receiving care in other more appropriate settings. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else from the public that would care to testify on House File um, 1198? Hearing none, I will now move to uh, Representative questions and comments. Uh, first on the list, I have Representative Edelson, then Representative Hicks, then Representative Backer, Representative Baker, and then Representative Keel. So Representative Edelson, if you'd like to go, and then remember we have three more bills to do. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna be very, very quick then. Um, I, I just wanna point out that um, the continuity of, uh, continuity of a care for the 27 years is, that's, that's fantastic, you guys. I just want us to hopefully acknowledge how amazing that is there's so many good things of this bill there's so many provisions but i just if you could help us i mean all of these things i'm massively supportive of and thank you to the mental health legislative networks for all of your work and representative hansen for yours if you could just paint that picture though because i think that is sometimes what's lost in this is so we had two er nurses and i think to the last testifier she talked about 30 um beds in the er and 13. tell us how with all of these provisions how, how does that slow our system from, because ERs are not helpful in terms of mental health situations. Somebody is just sitting there. We know this, right? Anybody that knows, mm -hmm. works in this area knows that. So tell us how this will, all of these provisions together, or what's gonna help slow that? Uh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Adelson. The way that I described this kind of in my opening comments, and I've described it to folks who don't work in this like you do all the time, is that we have these islands of care that are great. It's a lot of staff that's really support this, but unfortunately, getting to each of those islands is really, really hard, especially when you know how to navigate really choppy waters like that. And so this bill builds a bridge between those islands so people can more easily get between the pieces of care and coordinates those services, and also emphasizes that the emergency room isn't where we want Want people to get their first interaction of mental health care and that early intervention matters and then I'll turn it over to Sue because she'll probably have something much cooler to say than I do. Director Abner Holden. Um, Mr. Chairman members think of it as a front door and a back door so we want to prevent kids from going to the front door of that ER by making sure our crisis teams can really focus on children to make sure that if you're in school you can access school linked mental health services um, that you can get an in-home services through a PCA or whatever it takes to keep that child at home but then once a child lands there, we want to make sure that they have a place to go. And so making sure we have psychiatric residential treatment facilities that can actually um, meet the needs of those particular children. So I would kind of think about it broadly that way, front door and back door. Uh, Director Anderson. Mr. Chair, Representative Edelson, that's a great question. And I think that what we're trying to do is really fundamentally build a family-centered children's mental health continuum. And so it takes more than just one thing. But, you know, both uh, building the infrastructure for our community-based services hopefully can meet the need of the child and the family prior to needing that enhanced level of care. And when a child is very sick and needs an enhanced level of care, hopefully those services create that net for the child to receive support at home back when they transition into the community. And you know, just a shout out to the non-emergency medical transportation, getting to treatment is really important and most of our kids don't have driver's licenses. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next I will go to Representative Hicks. Thank you, Chair. And thank you everyone for bringing this bill forward. I know we're short on time, so I won't talk a lot. Um, but this bill is probably one of the bills I'm the most excited about this year. Um, I have had a ton of personal and professional experience with some of the folks in this room today um, in this space, being with parents in these situations and being the parent in some of these situations myself. And I know about the islands and I know about the lack of bridges. Um, and even if you know where all of the islands are and somebody told you where all the bridges are, you still can't always make them connect. And so I think this bill really works to fix the things that those of us have, have witnessed for many years. And so I wanna say thank you so much for this and for working together to really, really rebuild the very broken system. I'm extremely excited. Thank you, Representative Hicks. I will then bounce over to Representative uh, 
uh, Baker, and then Backer, and then Keel. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. I thought I was behind Representative Backer, so this is a plus for me. Um, <laughs> Representative Hansen, first time, um, first time. <laughs> you have carried a lot of bills. This is probably the most important bill I've seen you carry here. I completely support this. This is a great bunch of work by the Mental Health Legislative Network, so thank you to all who has, has worked on this. My only comment, really, Mr. Chair and others, this needs to be, again, unencumbered by the other stuff that we've been talking about around us with other uh, employment law changes, employment mandates. This is important. I'm really not trying to bring up other bills to this, but this is important that we do everything we can because everything that's been talked about today is about staffing, mm -hmm. getting more help to staffing, everything else we have to do that. So I'm just hoping that we can really uh, focus on this, get it out, get it out of the way. Let's get this moving forward without any other uh, restrictions and more rules that employers and providers have to have for, for new employees to come in. So just great bill, keep it going, but we have to have reasons like this to have some carve out. So keep up the great work on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Baker. Representative Becker. Um, thank you, Chair. It's always good to follow up Baker. So um, on the serious note, I would agree with Representative Baker. This is something important. But there is, um, represent a lot of priorities in the majority. First of all, so I got two quick questions. Sure. First of all, where does this fit with the majority um, and so forth? Where does this all fit in the majority? Is this something that's going to get done with, with your side of the aisle? Where do you see that? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Backer, for the question, and Representative Baker for the kind words as well. This is a priority because kids in Minnesota deserve a great start. We can be the best place in the country to live, work, and raise a family. My family's been in Minnesota for over 200 years, and so it's important to me that we keep Minnesota a great place to live, but we have to be real and acknowledge that there are holes in our system, and I think for a long time we haven't been able to find a lot of the solutions, but we've really built a great network here today from emergency room nurses to the folks providing care and to the advocates working with people most affected. That's a priority for me. I intend to keep moving this forward. You'll know that I've worked on other bills that address our workforce shortages. Those are what I would refer to as more macro bills. Those are things that will take time to flush out. Free college for social workers, making sure we can initiate uh, paid internships for every person going through that program, so on and so forth. I will digress on my whole agenda here, but uh, making sure that we are filling in these immediate needs for direct services are really important. I'll be presenting a bill later uh, today at the end of our committee hearing that will also address direct services. So I look forward to talking about that. But these services need to be done to keep kids out of the ER as their first place. It's terrifying. As a mom, I've been in the emergency room with my kids um, during mental health crises. And it's hard to provide for your kids what they need in that moment. And so this isn't just for because of my background or because of my areas of interest or because I've personally been affected. It's that no parents in Minnesota should have to keep going through this. So it will be a priority as long as I'm here. Representative Backer. And I would agree with you. I mean, um, I know we talked about emergency rooms, but a lot of those children first hop in ambulance, and, and I do see that. And this is not a poke to the majority, but I first of all would agree this needs to be our priority. This is more important for the schools than what we saw with the lunch program that was on the health floor. That's my opinion. It's not a poke. But the, the mental crisis is the number one thing for schools, for ER, and I would this needs to be a higher priority than um, feeding in children that can't afford it, those parents. So that's my opinion. Again, it's not a poke, because I do appreciate your work, but we can't do everything. We have to prioritize this. And on this side of the aisle, Baker and Backer, we're going behind you and Keel and all of us, because this is a higher priority in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I actually have a few questions, but I will preface it with this. I, this uh, December, went to the ER with my father. Um, he's 85, with the assumption that he was having a heart attack, but there was no place to go. So for the next 24 hours, we spent in the ER room with um, very little care because that's just the way it was. I, didn't, I don't blame the hospital or anything. Um, always waiting for what the next step was because that's what they thought he was having was a heart attack. He has a lot of cardiac problems, but I didn't think so. And um, so after 24 hours, I said, Dad, your option is maybe 
to get life lighted to Abbott where he's had some cardiac stuff done um, or wait till the weekend's over. By this time, my dad is on the ceiling. He is had it. He's going home. He pulls all his leads off. He's going to pull his IV that's got heparin lock in it. And I said, oh, please don't do that. That'll make a mess. And, and even though all those challenges were there, he actually said thank you to everyone. My point is, is that he went from a heart crisis, which wasn't, but we thought, to a mental health crisis that was unbelievable. And when I walked out the door with him, I thought to myself, anybody who had mental health problems, and I can just imagine a child sitting there because an adult is having trouble and he actually could lay and relax some, um, it, he was flipping off the walls. And he's a pretty calm person most of the time. So my point is, is that yes, I support this, but I have some real concerns about the funding we're spending. NEMTs, non-medical emergency transport, is in desperate need in my district. Thinking about transporting children to where they'll have to go, because we're talking about distance. We're not just talking about a half hour mm -hmm. ambulance ride or a, a car ride. So there needs to be funding. We, have, we need to think about this. These facilities are having a heck of a time taking people to uh, uh, cancer treatments or whatever. So anyway, so my, my concern is I see that there's some dollar signs in some of this, but I think we've got some problems. And the other issue, uh, Ms. Aberholden, you and I would talk about this, are we putting the cart before the horse? If we're gonna do this in rural Minnesota, we don't have the resources. I, they're working hard on it, but we don't have the resources. While I think this should be done, and my school districts are now calling me for a place to put a violent child, and we're not talking about a teenager, we're talking about a four-year-old. A male principal and a male superintendent could not calm down a four-year-old. It was, it was bad. And, um, and, and I would like to say that's a one-off incident, but it is not. Unfortunately, my schools are talking about doing mental health um, classroom away from the school where the violence is controlled. Um, so I'm, I'm in support of this, but I think members, we have to think about early and, and that we don't put the cart before the horse so that we have got the facilities before we've got the money to do things with. And, be all, by all means, let's bring it forward, Representative Hansen. Uh, let's see that sooner than later. Let's put that money toward it. We have a lot of money. I would agree with uh, Representative Backer that um, while it's nice to feed people, there are a lot of people that can afford to pay for their lunch. We should be taking this money to help with the mental health problems because that will help the families to be able to take care of their families. And that's what we should do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Thank you, Representative Keel. Representative Engen, did you want to? and can go ahead thank and you, then Mr. we'll Chair. go to the vote. Yeah, so just one quick question. I just want to say thank you first. Um, this is sorely needed, uh, especially now. Um, personally, my youngest brother, uh, he's still in high school, and he said for the first time not that long ago, I don't want to be here anymore. And I think that it is so important that we get these resources out the door quickly. Um, but, you know, and having discussions preliminary with my superintendent uh, in the district. They're worried that sometimes they don't have the ability to see a student's, um, what they're, or communicate with the healthcare provider mm -hmm. that's actually assessing that, mm -hmm. that child. Um, is that allowed for in this bill so that they can kind of have a better understanding of that student's needs? Uh, I'll, uh, Representative Hansen, and then we'll see if anybody else wants to add on. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Engen, and thanks for sharing your brother's story. We have to make sure we personalize this as much as possible because we've all been affected. So thank you for sharing that. And then I will defer to the experts on the coordination of care, but there are pieces of the bill that touch on coordinated care a little bit, um, and so I'll let them answer that. Director Anderson. Mr. Chair, Representative Engen, uh, school-linked mental health already allows for that level of coordination. 
And part of what we really heard in that working group on CTSS was a desire from schools to have an opportunity to team up more with our community-based providers. So that's what you see reflected in what was amended, the clinical care coordination, because it is really a top priority. It depends on the personnel, um, but, but th that is a shared goal reflected in this bill. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Representative. Thank, thank you, Representative Angan, you're done? Just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, with that, uh, Representative Hansen uh, renews her motion that House File 1198, as amended, be re referred to the uh, Committee on Children and Families Policy and Finance. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. All, uh, our, and the bill 1198, as amended, is re referred to the Children and Families Finance and Policy Committee. Our next bill will be House File 1416 from Representative Coran. We are going to be short on time, so we'll be limiting each testifier on this bill to two minutes. Representative Coran, if you'd like to come forward, uh, and uh, to, I would like you to move your bill and begin your presentation. Ah, yes, thank you, Chair. I move to refer House File 1416 to the Human Services Finance Committee. All right, Representative Coran moves her bill to re-refer House File 1416 to the Human Services Finance Committee. We have no amendments. Please explain your bill and then we'll go to test fires. Thank you. Um, so this bill is regarding ICF modifications. Uh, ICF for, ICS refers to integrated community supports, which is a new service under Minnesota's disability waivers that be, first became available in 2021. Uh, it was introduced as part of phase one of waiver reimagine. Uh, conceptually, it's designed to provide one-to-one -one training and support to meet a person's assessed needs and goals in skills like community participation, health, safety, wellness, household management, and adaptive skills. ICS must be provided in unlicensed provider-controlled community settings, like apartment or multi-unit um, buildings, or out in the community. Um, before Waiver Reimagine simplified the service menu, other effective service models existed for uh, supported apartment settings like supportive, uh, supportive Living Services or SLS. Um, and that was available as a daily rate service and contained in the same framework components as adult foster care, um, just like flexible shared um, and individual hours for awake, sleep, remote staffing, et cetera. Um, the ability to use this flexible framework, um, these flexible framework components, is what has historically allowed supported apartment programs to customize services while meeting the intermittent support needs of each person in that program. Uh, ICS became available for people on the brain injury and caddy waivers in 2021, and for people on the CAC and DD waivers uh, as of January 1st of this year. Um, this transition, unfortunately, to ICS is not going smoothly. Uh, some providers have decided not to participate in ICS, resulting in service termination for the individuals they were supporting. Other providers are still trying to figure out if they can reasonably continue to meet people's identified needs uh, while m remaining fiscally viable, or if ICS um, will become too much of a financial and operational drain on their resources. Um, for the individuals, um, the choices they are left with could be to change providers, move to a different location, perhaps a less independent setting, or keep their apartment and their provider and then purchase their other services, uh, like nursing, transportation, et cetera, on the open market. None of these choices are ideal, uh, so the best solution is to make changes to ICS and statute. Um, so HF 1416 modifies the ICS service by giving providers more f flexibility in how it's delivered, and it allows providers to deliver the same range of supportive services um, that was previously allowed under the SLS framework. And I will turn to my testifiers to further explain the bill. Okay, very good. As we go to testifiers, please try to keep your comments to two minutes. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself and start your testimony, please. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Fisher. <clears throat> Members of the committee, for the record, my name is Ken Bentz. I'm the Director of Research Analysis and Policy for ARM, an association dedicated to leading the advancement of home and community-based services and supporting over 130 residential service providers across the state. Representative Kern did a nice job of introducing the purpose of this bill, and we certainly agree with its intent. But we see that there are opportunities to improve the structure of the service to allow providers more flexibility and efficiency in supporting apartment living, 
with the level of support specified in each person's assessed need and their support plan. So I get to briefly go into some of the technical details and I've abbreviated this. Um, more details available in the written testimony that I've submitted that's available to you in your packets. But this bill essentially would allow an ICS provider to deliver the service in, a, in more than one building in a multi-building apartment complex to change existing restrictions to allow multiple ICS providers to operate in a multi-unit building, which is subject to department review, and it would change the minimum size of an ICS setting from three units to two. We've been careful to, through this bill, to ensure that settings are not isolating while allowing more than one provider to deliver ICS and other residential waiver services in the same building or complex and it would expand housing options by expanding an individual's choice of providers. With the severe staffing and housing shortages that were impacting all sectors of our economy, we believe that removing these restrictions would allow more people to access the benefits of ICS in a more cost-effective manner. Finally, this bill would modify the rate structure of ICS within the, the disability waiver rate system to more closely emulate the former SLS service, as Representative Curran said, which would allow ICS providers to provide the appropriate level of support, including shared staffing, nursing, and transportation, which would reduce isolation and promote community integration. As in all waiver services, the formal assessment and service planning process determines the level of support a person is eligible for. This bill would allow the individual to have greater choice of providers from which they receive their services. Okay. Next, I'd like to turn this over to one of our provider members, Mr. Joe Peterson. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Peterson, would you like to come forward and introduce yourself and, be self and begin your testimony, please? Thank you, Chair Fisher and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Joe Peterson. I am the Director of Community Living for Opportunity Partners, a disability service provider in the metro area. I oversee numerous programs that are in the process of transitioning to ICS. As a provider, I've been working for the last two years on how to make the transition to ICS a positive one. The vision of ICS is to provide effective support to people who desire maximum independence in the community, but still require intermittent services up to 24 hours a day. As it's currently designed, there are gaps in ICS that create barriers to continuity of care and ultimately threaten the future viability of this service. ICS is considered a one-on-one -on -one service and as a result, does not have the flexibility to meet people's support needs effectively and efficiently. The concept of ICS as a one-on-one -on -one service excludes certain types of service from the framework with the ultimate goal of allowing for greater choice. The reality is ICS lacks certain components to deliver effective, sustainable commun community supports and actually limits the choice of people receiving ICS. Additionally, the framework does not have options for providers to deliver nursing and transportation services. Nursing and transportation have long been in integrated with apartment services and are key components for people who need that level of support. People transitioning to ICS rely on core, core services such as these to meet their support needs and to participate in vital activities of daily living. ICS recipients currently have the choice to purchase nursing and transportation from outside vendors on the market, but, do, but, but not from their ICS provider. This simply does not make sense. ICS providers are extremely well positioned to pro provide comprehensive services, effectively and efficiently, while ensuring overall continuity of care. People should have the option for their ICS provider to deliver these core services versus dividing them across outside entities, especially in the current climate when the workforce crisis poses a ma major barrier. If you could wrap up, please. It's unrealistic to conceive a scenario where ICS providers won't be obligated to provide some level of nursing and transportation to meet a person's fundamental needs. If providers are not re reimbursed for these uh, fundamental needs, they will simply be forced to stop providing them. That means that we may have to stop helping people with medical appointments, medical management, uh, with their ICS provider, as well as, as activities that require staff transportation into the community. Representative Crin said that people have been successfully living in supportive apartments for decades and were previously allowed to receive the SLS daily. The SLS daily framework was effective because it allowed for flexible, essential service components 
thing like things like shared staffing as well as individual staffing, overnight hours, transportation, and nursing. My concern is the absence of these key components will result in ICS not being able to, to support a person's assessed needs, ultimately jeopardizing their services and potentially their housing. The stringent limitations on the ICS framework will also make it extremely difficult for providers to deliver the service while remaining financially viable. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next I have Josh Berg. After Josh Berg is Patty Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Josh Berg. I work with Accessible Space, Inc. Uh, I touched on this about three weeks ago, so I won't belabor my point, um, but basically just uh, letting you folks know that uh, ASI is one of the, the, the largest ICS providers in the state. Currently, we transitioned eight of our formerly customized living apartment settings to ICS over the last six months. Uh, in that, you'll hear from uh, my colleague Patty here talk about the nursing services that we are now just absorbing the costs, as I alluded to last time, um, that we're formerly reimbursed through customized living uh, and are not now in ICS. Um, and so I just would encourage um, the department uh, if there is any questions or concerns related to any of the language that we work creatively to to figure this out, which uh, there are many of us providers that uh, are very excited about the ICS uh, uh, program here and are looking to expand and grow it. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next, Patty, uh, Party, Patty Armstrong, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself. After Patty Armstrong will be Zach Johnson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Patty Armstrong, and I am the nurse manager at Accessible Space Incorporated. I have been a nurse for 26 years and with ASI since 1996. Today, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about the critical nursing oversight I and my team plays in supporting our residents. We provide clinical services such as medication management for most of our residents. We provide administration assistance. Sometimes the nurse sets up medications for individuals who can be independent with their self-administration. We obtain physician's orders, monitor compliance, and ensure accuracy of medications being administered by our unlicensed staff. We provide supervision, oversight, triage to the staff who have been trained and delegated to administer medications. Without oversight, more issues would arise, such as med errors, new orders not being started timely, and running out of necessary medications. We also support individuals with complex medical needs. Mobility impairments, which are in, the need, are, are in need of medical lift, or mechanical lift transfers, training and oversight to ensure appropriate equipment that include Hoyer lifts, easy stands, sit-to-stands, ceiling lifts, etc. We train, supervise, and support staff who do ball programs due to the resident not being able to have a ball movement on their own. We have residents who need support with catheters, maybe a suprapubic catheter, mitrofenov, urostomies. We have residents who need G-tube feedings, perhaps via pump or bolus. We train, supervise, and support staff who provide respiratory assistance via oxygen, CPAP, and BiPAPs. We also deal with um, diabetes and wound care. We provide a connection to resident case managers, families, doctors, and specialists, which promotes continuity of care. We take a lead role in hospital TCU discharges any day of the week at any time so our residents can get back to their homes and resume their independence with staff support. This ensures safe, timely, and systems in place to prevent recurrent hospitalizations and further issues. We are on call to support the staff and residents 24-7, 365. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, with that, uh, members, are there any comments? We have one more. Oops, excuse me. Uh, what, I'm sorry, Mr. Zach Johnson. Apologize. <laughs> Mr. Zach Johnson? Oh, I apologize. I didn't see you. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, we can. My name is Zach Johnson, and I'm a 20-year resident and also a board member of Accessible Space Incorporated. And I, I'd just like to talk to you today about how important nursing services are when you have a complex medical need. 
um, actually going to a, to, physically going to a doctor's office when you ha have a complex me medical need isn't the most accessible thing in the world. So the more you can get solved at home with people that work directly with you, the better off you are because you can uh, do it, get it done faster so it doesn't become a bigger problem. Like if you have a skin problem or a bladder infection, the nurse can call the doctor who then can prescribe the medication, right? And you can get it done right at your home so the problem doesn't uh, get worse and uh, then you might be in a more expensive hospitalization type setting so the nurse is like the connective tissue between the direct support professionals and your doctor that's prescribing whatever medical service you might need. And because of that, I, in over 20 years with ASI, I've never been hospitalized for anything. So I think it has a lot to do with just the avail availability of nurses and staff that I know to be, to be able to help me. And I don't have to schedule transportation and stuff if I can just get it all taken care of at home. And the nurse is kind of like the administrator that helps train the, the direct support staff to do what the doctor requires without having to go to the hospital or doctor's office mm -hmm. and then having to go back home and do it. Because when you go to a doctor's office, sometimes it's just so they can sign the piece of paper saying you need it. So I think the nursing is a critical conduit. Thanks for allowing me to speak to you today and I'll take any questions if you have. It. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson, for being here and sharing with us today. I appreciate it. With that, members, uh, are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, Representative Cran, if you'd like to make closing uh, comments and renew your motion. Uh, yes, I'll keep it brief. Um, thank you so much to the committee for hearing the bill and uh, thank you uh, very much for our testifiers today um, who couldn't have told the story any better. Um, and with that, I renew my motion to refer House File 1416 to the Human, fin Human Services Finance Committee. All those in favor of referring House File 1416 to Human Services Finance Committee signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carries. House File 1416 is referred to the Human Services Finance Committee. Next bill is House File 1566, Representative Hansen. If you'd like to come down to your table, you've got two test fires if they'd also like to come forward. Uh, Representative Hansen, if you'd like to uh, move your bill, please. Thank you, Chair. And I move to refer House File 1566 to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. Okay, Representative Hansen moves her House File 1566 for referral to the Health Finance and Policy Committee. If you'd like to begin your presentation, please. And then we'll go to your testifiers. And we've still got another bill we'd like to get into yet. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members, for your time today. I just want to start off by grounding us because the subject matter of this bill can be really heavy for some people. So I want to just, again, ground us in the grief that this subject brings for so many people. For many years, we've talked about the mental health crisis we are in, just like I mentioned on my last bill. We've talked about solutions for the workforce and bed shortages, inadequate access to care, and the complicated systems and waiver services. 
And again, this all takes time to address, but we need to be sure that we are equally investing in solutions that provide care directly to people who need it most when they are feeling suicidal or are in crisis. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people, and it's the 10th leading cause of death overall. Every year in the United States, more people die by suicide than in car accidents. For one person, every one person who dies by suicide, 316 more seriously consider it, but do not kill themselves. Last year, seven, I'm sorry, in 2021, 777 Minnesotans died by suicide. And given that number and the ratio I just quoted, that means that there's likely more than 245,000 Minnesotans who considered suicide. That's over five of our house districts combined members. People are struggling and we must continue to expand services to people who are in crisis. And this bill is one of the many tools that we need to be sure Minnesotans can access the care they need. House file 1566 implements the suicide and crisis lifeline. It defines the services, assigns the duties and creates a special revenue account. And it defines the funds needed to sustain the services into the future. The Federal National Suicide Hotline Designation Act of 2020 designated 988 as the three digit number for mental health and suicidal crisis, allowing the states to use a 988 fee for the crisis center operations and related services. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline was formerly known as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline's new three digit number la launched last July, transitioning the former 1-800-273-TALK phone number. The new number is intended to be easy to remember, similar to how we all remember to dial 911 for medical emergencies. The service, um, this service is provi provides free and confidential support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress. A national network of over 200 local crisis centers across the United States provide 24 hour care, seven days a week to families and people in crisis nationwide. Since July of 2022, about 2.1 million calls, texts, and chats to the new 988 number have been routed to re response centers across the country. Switching to 988 on July 16th here in Minnesota, our four call centers have increased their uh, call load by 44%. Minnesota has seen a 173% increase in web chats and a very, very alarming 250% increase in texts. Crises are typically de-escalated on the call with less than 2% of lifeline calls engaging emergency services or mobile crisis response. However, it's critical that calls to 988 from Minnesotans be answered in our own state so that connections to local resources and mobile crisis response can be made as needed. We have worked really hard in the legislature and we need to keep working hard to invest in building our, out our mobile mental health crisis system in Minnesota. But a person who needs that level of response won't get it if their call is answered in another state. Our lifeline centers have made great progress in expanding and meeting the need, but we don't want to lose ground or revert back to having a large number of calls from Minnesota be answered outside our state. Short term federal funding has helped 988 lifeline centers in Minnesota build the capacity to meet the increased need and answer a much higher number of calls in state. That in-state answer rate has nearly doubled from 21 to 22, from just 43% in 21 to 83% in 22. It, this is not ongoing funding though, and we need to make sure we create a stable and sustain, sustainable model to support the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline in Minnesota long-term. In the past, the state has made only a minimal investment in the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, and we can't depend on a current budget surplus to sustain this work moving forward. And as such, this bill appropriates $8 million in 2024 and $4 million in 2025 so the services can continue. The ongoing funding for this is defined in Subdivision 4 in the form of a telecommunications fee between 12 to 25 cents per mobile line and landline. In 2021, a report from NAMI National found that nearly three out of four adults surveyed, about 73%, said that they would be willing to pay a monthly fee on their phone bills to support this system. Similarly, we charge these fees for 911. That's how we pay for that service. 
More than a third of the respondents said that they were willing to pay over a dollar per month. Again, my bill only restricts us to 12 to 25 cents. But once respondents were told that average fees for 911 are about a dollar a month, the overall support for a fee increased to 78%. And so there's a lot of support for this being at least a dollar. But again, my bill keeps us between 12 and 25 cents. I've shared with many of you that I was the last person to speak with a wonderful friend before he took his own life. And I know that I'm not the only one who's been deeply scarred by the pain of losing someone to suicide or by watching someone we love suffer. Like many others, we called for crisis services at the first sign of worry, but they were unavailable for a few days. We scheduled for the next available time, but it was quickly too late for Keegan. And I'm carrying this bill so we can do more to support people like my friend and other loved ones who were lost too soon. These are services that we all hope we never need, but these are also services that we have to be real and honest about needing in our society. We often don't know we need them until it's too late or it's an emergency. So I hope you join me in supporting this bill so that this service is there for people who need it when they need it. Thank you, Tess. And I'll turn it over okay. to my testifiers. Thank you, Representative Hanson. Before we start, I just want to give a quick heads up that uh, uh, this will be our last bill today. Uh, House File 1627. I'm going to hold it over till next to a future meeting because it's going to. I don't want to cut up a bill between two meetings, so I just want to give you folks a heads up on that. So we've got 10 minutes. We can spend the final 10 minutes on this bill here. So thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Shannon uh, Mulville Hill. If you'd like to introduce yourself and go ahead and begin your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Shannon Mulvihill, Executive Director with Mental Health Minnesota. And I did cross out about two thirds of my testimony. So uh, <laughs> I'll leave plenty of time for my other testifier to join, to join as well. Um, first, just want to express the uh, support of the Mental Health Legislative Network um, of this bill to provide sustainable funding for the 988 response. Um, this is one of a number of bills, um, like the children's bill that you heard earlier, that we're working to move forward as a network. Um, the network has long recognized the importance of building a comprehensive mental health system in our state and access to crisis services um, is certainly a key part of meeting that need. Um, I, um, I've responded to 988 calls myself in a kind of a former life and um, before it was called 988. Um, calls from people who were struggling with their symptoms of a, of a serious mental illness over time, struggling with isolation or suicidal thoughts but also calls from people who had never struggled with their mental health before, um, but a recent event had them really reeling and wondering whether their family and the world in general would be better off without them. Um, an easy to remember and well publicized phone number like 988 that provides a source of help in a given moment of need can and does save lives. The National Suicide Hotline Designation Act of 2020 that um, Representative Hansen mentioned earlier does allow states to use a 988 fee for crisis center operations and related services. The broad allowable use of these fees really reflects our reality in the mental health system. Um, our system across the country is far behind any emergency response to a physical health condition, and we need to address mental health crises with appropriate expertise and resources. Minnesota, along with the rest of the country, of course, has a 911 system to address physical health emergencies. The 988 service fees um, indicated in this bill would ensure an equitable and appropriate response for mental health crisis that is available across the state. So building a capacity for the state's 988 lifeline centers by initiating a telecom fee is really a critical step toward addressing mental health and crisis response need across our state. And with that, I'm happy to turn it over to our other testifier. Certainly, thank you. Uh, thank Patrick Rowan, if you'd like to come forward, introduce yourself and begin your testimony, please. Thank you, Chairman Fisher and members of the committee. My name is Patrick Rohn. Uh, I'm the president of the board for Mental Health Minnesota, but that's the least important of my titles. Uh, the most important for these purposes is I'm a mental illness survivor. I like to phrase it that way because just like cancer does, can, and kill people, so does mental illness. And I myself have been affected personally. I was diagnosed as what we now call bipolar at age 14. 
My oldest uh, is severely compromised and has been in and out of treatment all of her life, uh, resulting in permanent uh, commitment, not permanent, um, indefinite commitment uh, at uh, the State Security Hospital in St. Peter. My youngest uh, suffers uh, severe anxiety for which she has IEP and other services through her school that allow her to be able to take tests and do homework and deal with that. But all that's really neither here nor there. That just gives you some background on, on me personally. But what I really want to say is just based on the numbers alone, I know that everybody in this room has someone in their life that at some point in their life has contemplated suicide. I don't know who that person is. It might be a friend. It might be a neighbor. It may be some celebrity, of course, that you were a big fan of and now they're gone. But I can tell you everybody in this room has been affected by somebody who either A, has contemplated or B, committed suicide. What this is really about, this specific bill, is you helping your friends and your neighbors, Minnesotans, helping other Minnesotans. Because if 250,000 people, 250,000 Minnesotans contemplated, seriously contemplated suicide last year, I can say that probably was a friend or a neighbor of yours, maybe someone down the street, maybe somebody at work, maybe someone who you play pickleball with, I don't know, but it was somebody. Would you pay 25 cents a month to make sure that they had a number they could call and get direct support for someone who really got it, really understood what they were going through and knew exactly what to do in that situation. Not 911, 911 is fine. The police may know what to do. Maybe they've approached this before, maybe not. You know, ER, paramedics, sure. But to be able to call and talk to somebody who actually gets it, who's had direct experience with that particular problem is invaluable. A dollar, 25 cents, five dollars, it doesn't matter. Help your neighbors, help your friends. With thank, that, I yield. Thank you for your testimony and for sharing. Uh, Representative uh, uh, Baker and then Finke, and then we're gonna go to the vote. We got three minutes before committee ends, so. Uh, Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, uh, appreciate the extra time. Just to, I had a quick question for the author. Again, uh, Resident Hansen, good bill. I want to support this bill. One of the things that I know you want to do is add a, f a fee to a need that is there. Um, and again, we don't have time to talk about this now. This is not a fiscal committee. I'd like to engage, if I could, with you later on about how we could possibly take it out of the current sales taxes in the FCC charges is that we're kind of collecting. Have you looked into possibly instead of raising a new fee to just take out what's currently being collected through other you know, fees during our, all of our, our telecom bills and things like that? Have you explored that option uh, at this point? Is that something we could look at before it goes further? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Baker. We did talk about whether or not we should pull this money from the surplus and just put this into the special revenue account and use that there. Unfortunately, I am going to go out, out on a limb here and say the legislature, we're not always great about looping back about things that we have to keep funding. And for fear of something like this falling off or not being there, we felt it was best to keep this structure in place the way it is so that we don't have to worry about the changes with maybe local option sales tax or none of those or anything like that. Um, but we did have the conversation and if you'd like, I can let you answer any further on that. Uh, Ms. Mulville Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative. Um, yeah, I, I think I would just echo if, if this is really kind of the national model in terms of how we're trying to approach it. It's how a lot of the states are, are looking at it is really likening it to a 911 response fee. So it's a more similar approach and it's a really dedicated pot of money. So it won't go back to the general fund or anything. It's really focused on that specific service. Mr. Chair, really quickly, I don't disagree with the word you said. I think we're just, I'm just suggesting we don't, 
we take it out of the current taxes we're collecting mm -hmm. on these on these commerce uh, lines. Let's talk about this. I'd like to add an amendment possibly for a, for your consideration in a future meeting. This is something I think that again ongoing should be simple. Let's let's change statute to take it out of the current uh, dollars that folks are paying. Again, I like the idea. Let's let's move it along. I'm looking forward to working with you on this. Thank you. Uh, Representative Finke is pulled off. Uh, Representative Cran. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick note, uh, Representative Hanson, I really appreciate this, um, and we share some unfortunate uh, circumstances in our history, as I'm sure a lot of us in this room do. Um, 2015, I lost a friend uh, to suicide. Three years later, um, one of my last calls as a deputy was to a young man who called 911 and um, ended his life over the phone. Um, so I'm, I just wanted to share that, and um, thank you for this bill. This is something we need. Thank you. Thank you. With that, Representative Hansen, re oops. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Edelson, go right really? ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to be really quick. Representative Baker and Representative um, Hansen, I would strongly suggest that you you don't do an amendment, that you keep it as a fee. This is this is why we are where we are with our mental health system, is when we try to fund it in a different way. Um, mental health is no different than your physical health. Mm -hmm. We need to fund it in the exact same ways. Mm -hmm. So 911 is funded by a fee. 988 should be funded by a fee. Thank you. Rep. Hansen, if you'd like to make closing comments and then renew your motion. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. And I just want to add to this point about not doing it differently. When folks look at their cell phone bills, they see a 911 fee. We want people to see a 988 fee so that if they themselves ever face this, maybe they'll be like, what is this 988 fee? And hopefully we'll look it up. So there is a piece of this that is to help spread the word because so many people don't know that this service is available. If you see extra money show up on your cell phone bill, chances are you're going to Google it. And that's what we want here. So um, just thank you everybody for the vulnerable conversation here. And thank Thanks for sharing, Representative Corinne. Um, and I would just ask for your support on this. I renew my motion to refer House File 1566 to the Health Policy and Finance Committee. Thank you, Chair. All those in favor of referring House File 1566 to the Health Finance and Policy Committee, please signify by saying aye. 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 All the polls say nay. The motion prevails. House File 1566 is referred to the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, on Wednesday, the 22nd, we're going to be hearing a series of bills and a presentation dedicated to address the workforce supports and addressing the workforce shortage to direct support professionals. And with that, we are adjourned.